great pleasure for me to welcome everyone to this webinar co-organized by the Max Planck Institute Luxembourg for Procedural Law and the University of Richmond School of Law and co-sponsored by the American Society of International Law, the American branch of the International Law Association and Transnational Dispute Management. Uh, let me begin with a few logistical information more precisely for the attendees. If you would like to ask questions, please do it using the Q&A uh, comment that you have at the bottom on the right and not through the chat. If your question is more specifically addressed to one of the speakers, please make it clear and we will follow the questions at our end and uh, depending on their number, possibly we will bundle them. And also I inform you that the session is broadcasted and will be available for people who could not attend this uh, webinar. So the draft code of conduct for adjudicators in investor state dispute settlement, a low hanging fruit or a unreachable goal. The idea of such a code of conduct is far from new. However, the ongoing discussions on the reform of investor state dispute uh, settlement, especially in Ancitral Working Group 3, has given to it a new momentum. The draft code we are going to discuss today was prepared jointly by the secretariats of ICSID and Ancitral. It was published together with a commentary and a comparative table of existing codes. The title we have proposed for this panel tries to capture the spectrum of comment that this draft has already triggered. At one hand, those who think that such a code is the easy part of the reform of ISDS, that there, and, and there, that there would exist already a wide consensus. At the other end of the spectrum, those who think that, that such a consensus is out of reach. At one end of the consensus, those who think that such a code is an absolute minimum to confirm or renew the legitimacy of ISDS. At the other end of the spectrum, those who think that such a code is not such a good thing, that it is unrealistic and could have a very negative impact. Professor Chiara Giorgetti from the University of Richmond was already extensively uh, published on ethics in international adjudication, has contributed to the elaboration of the draft code, especially during her time as scholar in residence at ICSID, where it was her main responsibility. Together, we thought it would be good to open the debate about this code, this draft code, and we are delighted to host a stellar panel for this debate. So let me uh, welcome in both our names, Prof Professor Gabrielle kaufmann Koller from the University of Geneva, where she founded and directed for almost 10 years the famous MEETS, the Geneva LLM in International Dispute Settlement. She is also the immediate past president and now honorary president of ICA. I cannot give justice to her many achievements, but only uh, recall that she is also among the most renowned, arbitrate, uh, most renowned arbitrators in the world. Professor John Crook, who teaches international arbitration at George Washington University and is judge on NATO's administrative tribunal. To name only a few of his achievements, he is also a very experienced arbitrator and president of arbitra arbitral tribunals and has been a commissioner on the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission after having worked for many years in the U.S. State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor and been U.S. agent in, at the U.S.-Iran Claims Tribunal. Ms. Mayre Uran bidegain with my French accent, uh, who is currently the head of the program for the defense of the state in international investment arbitration at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, of Chile. She gained experience in international arbitration by working in a big law firm before joining ICSID and acting as legal counsel for several years there and uh, then coming back to Chile. And André von Walter, who is team leader of the unit Legal Affairs and Dispute Settlement of the Digi Trade of the European Commission, 
is one of the negotiators of the new generation of the EU external agreements and one of the thinkers of the EU proposals regarding investor state dispute settlement, a topic on which he gained experience by being, among other things, political advisor and negotiator for international investment for, at the French Ministry of uh, Foreign and European Affairs. Our panel will start with a short presentation of the draft code by Professor Giorgetti. I will then ask each of the panelists for a general comment. We will then move to address more specific issues before opening the Q&A session. Here is our program. Now I'm delighted to give the floor to Professor Giorgetti. Many thanks and uh, welcome, hello to all the participants and thank you, Helen, for um, a very nice, very warm welcome for organizing um, this webinar. Thank you also to the Mass Planck Institute in Luxembourg and Richmond Law School, my own university for sponsoring and to Avila, Ezil and TDM as you said for co-sponsoring. Um, as you said, my name is Chiara Giorgetti. I'm a professor uh, of law at Richmond Law School. Um, and um, I was uh, a scholar in residence as Ix at ICSID for a few months last year. Uh, when I was on sabbatical at Richmond. And while at ICSID, I had the privilege to work uh, also on the draft of conduct. And as Alain mentioned, I've actually been interested in issue of ethics uh, for quite some time. Uh, today I'm here as, as a scholar and an expert in this issue. And what I would like to do is actually kind of two things. I would like to kind of introduce the code and give a brief overview of the code itself and then give some general principles of the code, some over, overarching principles I, uh, as I understand them. I would like to share with you a presentation uh, that will might make it clearer um, um, what, I, uh, what I see are the main issues. Um, now, um, as Elena suggested, the Secretariat of Ixit and Ancetral were requested by Ancetral Working Group 3, 3 to draft a code of conduct to then be discussed by the delegates. The draft code was published on May 1st and is now open from comments from stakeholders and I think comments are um, to be um, um, given by, uh, by October uh, 15th. Uh, the draft code has 12 articles and uh, it includes commenters explaining why certain policy issues exist and the reason behind them and some of the issues to be discussed. In terms of the structure of the code, we'll say that there are three main parts. Article 1 and 1 to 3 set the stage. Articles 4 to 11 develop the framework and specify the obligations. And Article 12 regulates enforcement. Uh, so for Article 1 to 3, it's interesting to note Article 1 provides definition uh, and it provides that the code it's, uh, uh, applies to adjudicators in really the largest sense. It applies to arbitrators, members of international courts, uh, ad hoc annulment committee, appeal committee, committee and judges of, of permanent mechanism. It also defines ISDS as a dispute between a foreign investor and a state or IEO uh, arising under a treaty, domestic law or a contract. And it provides the application. So the code applies to both adjudicators, assistants and candidates to become adjudicator. Article 3 sets the framework of duties and responsibilities and essentially provides the core of all the obligations um, uh, of adjudicators. So it provides the responsibility and duty to be independent and impartial, um, to have the highest standards of integrity, fairness and competence, um, provides the requirement of availability and active diligence, civility and efficiency, uh, and also comply with confidentiality and non-disclosure obligations. Um, the article from 4 to 11 then develop these principles that are articulated in Article 3. Article 4 requires an independence and impartiality, which is of course the, one of the main um, principles of, uh, of adjudicators. Uh, and it is very much in line with existing codes uh, at CETA um, and CPTPP. Article 5 then develops uh, and develops for the requirement of disclosure, requires under, under disclosure of possible conflicts of interest, requires extensive and continuous disclosure of direct or indirect conflicts of interest, 
And the current Hazardous frame now contains several uh, bracketed tests that provides different options, including a temporal uh, limit, uh, a discussion on what parties uh, uh, should, uh, relationship to what parties should be included in terms of disclosure, what kind of case, uh, and certain uh, issues of like list of publications that are targeted to regulating uh, issue conflict. Article 6 um, is, uh, is also very important and really I would say one of the main uh, possible um, uh, issue in, in the code uh, and has already generated some discussion. It provides a limit on multiple roles and this is another uh, text that contains many different bracketed tests so that state delegates may discuss all the different options, including again a temporal requirement or what kind of parties and what kind of um, multiple roles are, are, are to be prohibited or regulated or disclosed under the code. Additional provisions that are included in the code, Article 7, um, includes uh, the duty of integrity, fairness and competence. Article 8 um, requires a, um, a, a provides availability, diligence, civility and efficiency. And note that Article 8.2 also applies or uh, provides a bracketed text that says adjudicators shall refrain from serving in more than pending ISDS, a certain amount of pending ISDS proceedings so they may regulate uh, multiple I think we have a small problem of connection with Chiara, unstable connection. I hope you will be back very soon. I think we have lost, unfortunately, we have lost Chiara, which means that we face exactly the kind of uh, technical impediment which can happen in this in these circumstances. So um, at least uh, we'll uh, try to, 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 to fill the gap. We have already uh, seen uh, most of the content of, uh, of the code and uh, she was reaching the moment where she would speak about one main issue for the, for the code, which is the issue of implementation and, uh, and uh, enforcement. So um, um, what I propose is that we, we, we move on and uh, she will have an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to speak again uh, uh, later, um, except if she comes back rather quickly. So I propose to our commentators who already know well the draft code to, to uh, start with their general uh, comments. And I will invite uh, André to take the floor uh, first on that. Do you have a general comment on the draft code that you would like to share with the panelists and the, the attendees? Um, thank you very much, Hélène, and um, thank you very much for, to, for the organizers and for giving me the opportunity to participate in these discussions today. It was a pity that we couldn't hear the, the end of Chiara's presentation of the draft code of conduct, but um, I can admit I have read it already. So, um, and we know more or less what is in there. Um, as you all know, we have in particularly in the EU, we've been navigating through a very vivid public and political debate about ISDS for these last years and the question of independence and of impartiality of ISDS arbitrators has been and remains a core element of all these discussions. And you may also have seen that um, all the EU agreements that have been negotiated in these last years contain detailed rules on ethics, which are very similar to the elements that can be found in the draft code of conduct by Exit and Ancitrol. Um, and therefore, we also strongly support the, the elaboration of kind of multilateral code of conduct that could also apply such ethic rules to existing investment treaties, which are silent on those questions. I see that Chiara is back. Do you want me to 
uh, continue or take a break and re revert to Chiara. I mean, your hands for this. Sorry, I have also to, to, to unmute. I, I just said after your connection failed that you were reaching the moment where you would uh, mention uh, imp implementation and enforcement as major issues for the draft code. But uh, this was the first uh, step of your presentation. So I don't know if you, you would like to, to add uh, a few words on I can, uh, I, I'm so sorry. I, of course, these things happen when they shouldn't, so I, I really apologize. Um, I'll be happy to, uh, to continue very briefly. Um, as, uh, as I was saying, hopefully now if I share again, it works. But I was saying the, 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 the issue of enforcement is, is a major one, and I, I'm sorry I missed what Andre uh, was going to say, because I think it is a very interesting topic, and I think one that deserves, um, deserves discussion. So let me conclude, hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll, the, the connection will not drop again. Just talking about some general underlying principles because really I was kind of concluding on the provision themselves. Uh, but I just wanna share the way I see some underlying principles of the draft code. Um, on one issue, important issue, is the, issue, is the fact that it's, the code tries to be comprehensive. It addresses both sensitive issues that stakeholders have, uh, as have raised. Uh, and we all know about the ISDS uh, criticism uh, and really the, the, the code addresses uh, some of the main issues. So including multiple and repeat appointments, the, the, the issue of issue conflict, uh, the uh, double, double heading. Uh, and it includes a lot of bracketed tests so that it gives, uh, it gives options to state delegates. And it also addresses some basic ethical standards that, uh, that I think are included in most, uh, in most codes, including the issue of efficiency, issue of confidentiality, uh, issue of competence uh, of arbitrators, uh, and some basic issues that I think are very important. So the idea is that this code is, is, uh, is comprehensive and is responsive to what state uh, delegates have expressed uh, in, in the Ancestral Working Group 3 papers. Um, so I think that there are some documents, I mean, I'm sure that there are some documents on, on the website of Ancestral Working Group 3 that explains what states have said. And in my view, the code also responds, is responsive to the state's uh, um, preferences. Um, I think the code, I think is quite interesting because it is flexible. So it includes possible systemic changes to ISDS. So we don't know how ISDS will change. There are discussions about possible creating an appeal mechanism, possible creating a, a, a permanent court. Um, and the code is responsive, flexible enough so that it can be changed to be applied in all these different circumstances. And I think provision article one in the definition of adjudicators is an important one. This also gives choices. It's, it's flexible in the, in the sense that it also gives choices to delegates on many key issues. I highlighted article six before, and it's again on the website here. There's a lot of bracketed text that can be discussed and really raises some of the main policy issues that, are, that I think are, um, are now at, 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 uh, in, the, in the discussion of, of ISDS reform. So what does it mean to have uh, multiple roles? What do we mean, what roles? Um, what, what kind of treaties, what kind of, of parties would create uh, multiple roles? Uh, what, how do we work on, on issue conflict? What, what does it mean and how do we address it if we want to address it? So I think the code is drafted in a way that, that there's a lot of uh, bracketed text that, can, that state delegates can discuss, kind of fully known, and I think the commentary is also helping that. And my last principle uh, uh, that, I, that I think is also a general principle that is important to note is that the code is really based on disclosure requirements. So that Article 5 provides really extensive and continuous disclosure so that the adjudicator has a continuous duty to disclose and make an effort to disclose as much as possible so that the parties are informed and they are informed as soon as possible uh, and to, they have to, once, once the adjudicator has disclosed and continues to disclose, then the parties have to be, um, it can be satisfied to know and be, uh, and be sure that the adjudicator, that the 
uh, that is adjudicating um, their dispute, they're, they're, they're comfortable with the adjudicator. Um, so I am glad that the, this, that the connection didn't drop again, uh, and this really completes my, uh, my general overview uh, presentation of the code, and I very much look forward to, uh, to comments uh, by the other speakers. Thank you. Yeah, and André had already uh, started to comment because, as he said, he had already read the draft many times. So, André, thank you very much for having been so gracious to interrupt your comment to let Kira conclude. So, I give you back the floor to complete your general comment. Yeah, thank you. It's not about being gracious. I wanted to hear what Kira has to say, of course. And um, it's very interesting because, indeed, we have uh, the, the code has a lot of flexibilities. Um, and once again, Chiara, because you couldn't uh, hear what I was saying, we really want to compliment you and the ICSIS Secretariat and the Ancestral Secretariat for this tremendous and important work that you are doing on this. Um, I must say, when we read the code, I think from our perspective, um, it is still um, too much drafted through the lens of the current ad hoc arbitration system. And if you want to move to a more permanent mechanism, we believe that a number of provisions would need to, to be drafted differently or would become redundant, like, for example, pre-appointment interviews or discussion on fees or these things. But I, I may come back to these issues at a later stage in detail. In a more general way, um, we think it's a very important uh, work that has been done here. However, um, and this will not come as a surprise um, for the EU, a code of conduct alone is not sufficient to address all the problems of the current ISDS system. Of course, it doesn't address issues like inconsistency, uh, lack of predictability, duration and cost of the, of the proceedings, but also we're not fully convinced that a code of conduct alone is, is great it could be, uh, can sufficiently address all the different problems uh, relating to the independence and impartiality from ISDS decision makers. And I will not, I will refrain here from making, again, a pitch for the idea of a multilateral court, but I would like to just ask some questions maybe about the differences between permanent institutions and ad hoc arbitration tribunals when it comes to the questions of independence and impartiality of adjudicators. And because why, for example, are challenges to the appointment of judges in permanent courts the exception, whereas challenges to the appointment of ISDS arbitrators become more and more frequent? And so I think when we look at permanent courts, there are some general disclosure requirements, um, uh, but they are not set out in great details. Normally upon appointment, judges have to make general declarations committing to serve with independence and integrity. Uh, the statutes and rules of the court also have a general, general framed obligation of independence, impartiality, integrity, diligence, which are very similar to what we see here in Article 3 and 4 of the draft code of conduct. Um, normally in permanent courts, other professional activities are prohibited or strictly limited. And it is usually expected that judges would immediately recuse themselves in the scenario of a potential conflict of interest. So the procedures exist to entrust the presidents or sometimes the court itself as a college to decide on conflicts, but uh, such decisions are rather exceptional. Whereas in ISDS arbitration, uh, the dynamics seem to be a, a bit different. First of all, uh, formal recusals are very rare. Um, I believe that the equivalent to recusals occurs at the pre-appointment stage, meaning that arbitrators will not accept an appointment if they see a conflict of interest. But the fact remains that many arbitrators still compete for cases, so the incentive for recusals may be a bit different here than in permanent structures. Um, second, in the ad hoc system, arbitrators necessarily have other professional activities often in the international legal field with resulting contacts with potentially disputing parties so this also can increase the potential for conflicts of interest and finally in our view the the system of party appointment itself uh, leads to a dynamic where it becomes nearly normal to challenge the arbitrator appointed by the other disputing party um, if you revert to the very eloquent lecture by Jan Paulson 10 years ago on moral hazard. Um, he clearly said it very, very bluntly, saying that when a pointing party appointed arbitrator, the disputing parties do so with the overriding goal of winning the case, and each side assumes the other side to do the same. So with those assumptions in mind, 
it kind of becomes normal to question also the independence and impartiality of the other side's arbitrators and to search for grounds to, to challenge him or her. And so these assumptions become even stronger in our view in a system when, when you have also repeat appointments of the same arbitrators by the same disputing parties or law firms, which is also not um, rare in the current system. So to sum up, and this is just like my general statement, I'm happy to go to more details later. Uh, the fear that we have is that as long as we remain in a system of party appointed ad hoc adjudicators, that these dynamics will remain present under the surface and problems will keep coming up. And even if we have very clear rules on disclosure and, and challenges, every decision and debate about a potential challenge um, adds to the cost and duration of the proceedings, which is also a topic we need to address. So uh, this being said, and um, once trying to, to reply to the question of the seminar here, uh, we believe that this code of conduct is a very healthy and yummy fruit that is also low hanging and in reach. And so the joint work of ICSID and of UNCITROL and of you, Chiara, here is very much appreciated on this. And while I do love fruits, um, I think for us, from our point of view, this is probably more an appetizer or a starter. And we think that we still have to continue to prepare the main dish, which in our point of view is, of course, the structural reform of ISDS. Um, but I will stop here with my general comments and I'm happy to come into on more details later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, André, for <laughs> this uh, comment on appetizers. And uh, I will ask John whether he shares or not your, your point of view. Well, uh, it probably won't come as too much of a surprise that there's a good deal of, of what Andre had to say with which I do not agree. But I don't think uh, we have time to uh, convene that particular debate, particularly since you've given me five minutes to do some other things. Um, let me ask, am I coming through clearly? Very good. Well, uh, the trouble with the topic you've given us is that it does sort of invite some metaphorical abuse. And, and so I will uh, continue with Andre's uh, uh, consideration of the metaphor we were offered. Uh, and from my perspective, the code of conduct is a mixed fruit salad. Uh, there are some parts that are ripe and ready for consumption, but uh, as Kiara made clear, uh, there are some other parts that are far from being ripe and we will see whether they ultimately become uh, tasty and digestible. Now, as we move into this, I think we need to think about who are the consumers here. Uh, the, while this code is formally addressed to arbitrators, uh, it affects lots of other people. Council deciding whether to appoint, whether to challenge, uh, people, who are de people or institutions deciding challenges, any reviewing national courts, and ultimately, of course, the broader and increasingly critical uh, outside community. And I think for the code to be successful, it really needs to speak to all of these. So what's ready for consumption now? Uh, and as Kiara made clear in her remarks, uh, we've got things that are ready and things that aren't. But large portions are ready. Uh, large portions uh, are an effect that's something familiar to US practitioners, a, a, a restatement of the law. Uh, the code does an admirable job of concisely articulating uh, much of the arbitration world's understanding and learnings uh, of how judges, arbitrators should behave. Uh, most, I think, would be comfortable with Article 4 on independence and impartiality, Article 7 on independence, uh, sorry, integrity, fairness, and competence. Um, much of Article 8, subject to the debate about case limits, uh, but certainly the provisions on diligence, civility, and efficiency would hardly be con controversial, Article 9. Now, the drafters have, of course, included some significantly progressive elements, uh, very extensive standards of disclosure, which go beyond what uh, many practice or would regard as appropriate. Uh, the extent of disclosure is to be assessed by a reasonableness standard. Uh, and I'll come back to that perhaps in my second uh, round of comments. Now, there are also some nice little additions. Uh, I like 
Article 11.2, requiring adjudicators to keep time records. Uh, as, as you mentioned in my, your introduction, I spent 30-odd uh, years of my life working for governments and international organizations at an appreciably lower hour, hourly rate. Uh, and, and therefore, I have been impressed by the bills that at least a few of my colleagues have, have put in in the past. So what about the parts that aren't ripe? Uh, again, as Chiara makes clear, uh, there are some very significant issues that uh, have been covered to the extent they're covered by the broad disclosure requirements of Article 5 or, or left for discussion. The Article 5 commentary, for example, deals with issues relating to repeat appointments, looking for disclosure as the means of dealing with them. Same for issue conflicts. The arbitrators are to disclose their cases, publications, speeches, leaving it to others to assess whether they indicate a degree of predisposition. And finally, there's Article 6, uh, dealing with the controversial problem of multiple roles. Now here the commentary makes clear a point that Chiara, I think, quite properly addressed in her opening remarks, which is the threshold ought to be to discuss what we are talking about, because this is an issue that has been framed in a number of ways uh, and sometimes without a great deal of precision. So I think it's important as the negotiations and discussions proceed to be to clarify what it is precisely the, the problem is. Now, my perspective is that the problem is often less than it's made out to be uh, and involves a relatively small pool of individuals. And I am concerned that ill-considered uh, attempts to deal with it may wind up with uh, an unhealthy narrowing of the field of prospecting arbitrators at the cost of new entrants from underrepresented communities. Uh, I laid some of these thoughts out in a piece that uh, Kiara and uh, Jeff Dunoff uh, co-edited for a, uh, an Agile Unbound piece uh, that's available online. I thank Kiara and her colleagues for making that possible. So a concluding thought. Uh, the fruit salad is still under preparation. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but I suspect that even in its unfinished state, it will have an impact. Given the character of the work that's been done and the authority of the institutional backers, UNCITRAL and ICSID, uh, I think people concerned with arbitration will need to pay attention to it. Uh, the code shows where things are going, even if there's some hard work to be done before we get there and prospective arbitrators will ignore it at their potential peril. So I conclude. Uh, a long time ago, Dan Badansky and I uh, co-edited a symposium on what was then the uh, ILC's brand shiny new state responsibility articles. And in that symposium, my friend David Caron wrote a, a, a nice piece uh, in which he cautioned against giving the articles too much weight. He said, you know, they, 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 they look great, but, you know, maybe there's not much really behind some of them. Uh, I don't think you can say that about this code. Thank you very much, John, for your comments. I think the, the fruit metaphor will become more and more challenging. So, Gabrielle, I leave you. <laughs> I don't know what to say about the fruit. Uh, there was a nice song, Salade de Fruit, Joli, Joli, but I will not start singing, right? No, I just thank the, uh, thank the, um, Organizers, uh, the Max Planck, uh, Luxembourg, and Richmond uh, University for having me here. Uh, and I would also like to uh, congratulate the drafters uh, for putting together this piece of draft uh, code. It is a strong basis for the deliberations of the state. It's obviously um, just one building block, or uh, Andre said, an appetizer. Uh, but it's an important building block of the reform of ISDS. Uh, because of the nature of this exercise where we have five minutes, I will just select uh, two points and it will be somehow arbitrary. Uh, the first one is about, uh, it, it is it is a welcome development to have um, 
come a, a draft code that uh, seeks to reflect a transnational or international consensus on good practices for arbitrators. There's no dearth of soft law, hard law uh, out there about these topics for courts, for arbitrators, uh, by all kinds of organizations uh, and uh, institutions. But the difficulty with these other codes is that they do not reflect a consensus, provided, of course, the states get to uh, a conclusion on this draft code and we can speak of a consensus. Uh, it applies to, and, and I'll stay about uh, uh, scope uh, here, it applies to, to adjudicators, and that is defined as arbitrators and members of a permanent body. Uh, I think, as, as André already uh, mentioned, the issues for adjudicators in the sense of judges are somehow different from those that uh, are apply to arbitrators because the issues of individual independence are different uh, because of the activities of arbitrators because they are one-off adjudicators and not permanent uh, members of a standing body. And so uh, most provisions do somehow also apply to judges, but they're not particularly uh, well framed for judges. Of course, impartiality and independence applies to any type of dispute uh, settlement. Uh, but if you think about judges in terms of uh, in independence, what really matters is, is structural or in institutional independence, much less than uh, uh, personal or individual independence. And the structural independence uh, depends, goes to possible pressures or influences that constituent states of the court could exercise. And these cannot be dealt with with disclosure requirements, for instance. They must be dealt with with other protections like uh, financial security, security of tenure, uh, the, all these issues uh, will have to be dealt with at some point if we want to co uh, cover uh, the ground of both types of adjudicators. Um, there's another point. I said before there's no, uh, no, another general point. I said before there's no dearth of rules on these topics uh, in existence. Now, one difficult issue to me is the relationship between this code and these other uh, rules on uh, conduct of arbitrators. Uh, and these rules are found in treaties. I mean, there are a number of treaties now with rules on conduct of arbitrators. They're found in national arbitration law and they're found in arbitration rules. Now, National arbitration law is somehow absent from the commentary, and that misses the point that about 40% of investment arbitrations are non-exit investment arbitrations that are governed by national arbitration law and, and are uh, supervised, controlled by national courts. And that to what extent will national courts look to this code of conduct or to their own jurisprudence uh, about uh, impartiality of arbitrators, for instance? That is an, a question that we will have to uh, 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 assess very carefully. I would suggest, but that's very summary, if the code is a treaty, then, or tr in the nature of a treaty, then it will prevail over uh, any other type of uh, rule. If it is incorporated into arbitration rules, then according to usual uh, hierarchy of norms, the national, the mandatory national arbitration laws would prevail, uh, a fortiori if it is soft law. So there are difficult articulations there. The code seeks to address this in, in Article 12.2 that says that the disqualification and the removal 
procedures that exist in applicable rules continue to apply. But that, of course, is not so it's, it's a start, but it's not sufficient. Uh, on what grounds will these uh, disqualification procedures take place? On their own grounds or on the grounds of the code? And then if you you have a similar questions for annulment and uh, enforcement proceedings where a national court will have to decide whether uh, whether to apply the code or its own uh, national arbitration law. And uh, same thing for exit uh, annulment and same thing for enforcement under the New York Convention. So there's a whole range of uh, issues of articulation or hierarchy of norms, if you prefer, that will have to be thought through. But I, I stop here for my general comments. Thank you very much for this challenging question and uh, what is left in, in the dark for now. Now I, I give the floor to Mayri. Thank you very much, Helen, and, and thank you to Chiara and, of course, to the Max Planck Institute for Procedural Law and to the University of, of Richmond for this kind invitation and, and of course, for all, to all the participants for being here with us today. Um, in my next uh, few minutes, I will try to share with you my general impressions of the code. I'll first try to um, explain why, as uh, some of the other panelists have already said, I believe this is a welcome development. And I'll also try to highlight some of the questions that, uh, on which states may wish to pay special attention when they submit their comments uh, to the Secretariat, either in October or, or, before, or before that. But before I do so, um, I just want to make a general disclaimer that uh, as Chile is still uh, going through its internal coordination process to determine its position on the code of conduct, uh, anything that I say today cannot be attributed to the Republic of Chile and uh, can only be attributed to me. Now, um, having arrived to where we are today, this is uh, having before us an actual draft a uh, tangible basis for a discussion, I believe is already remarkable. Um, putting together a truly universal uh, common set of ethical norms is of course not an easy task. Ethical norms relate to uh, public policy issues that are in turn based on questions of what's moral, what's proper, what's adequate in a particular place, in a particular setting, in a particular culture. And so from this perspective, I do think that the code uh, at least attempts and, and, and goes far uh, trying to strike the appropriate balance by trying to include objective and, and, clear, and clear standards that could uh, ensure a uniform application of the rules, regardless of the form that the reform ISDS might take. We heard from Andre earlier on that, that this perhaps uh, doesn't quite fit for, for, or the EU believe that it doesn't quite fit for, for a court. Um, but I think it, it, it does try to, to, to get there. But it also uh, ensures that any decisions on potential infringement of, of the code and of its obligations remainly, remain mainly fact-driven. And this to address concerns over not only actual, but also perceived bias or conflict. Uh, the code also attempts to reflect questions that may differ in legal cultures, such as, for example, pre-appointment arbitrator interviews and questions also of confidentiality. So for this, we, we commend the joint work of the ICSID and, and UNCITRAL secretariats, and of course, of those like Chiara, who have been very critical for, for achieving this task in, in generally a timely, a very timely manner. And apart from the content of the code, we think this is, has been a great example of cooperation between international organizations that many delegations have been requesting for uh, quite some time. So I think generally it's, it's a very welcome development and I'll mention a couple of, of other points why this is the case. Now, first, uh, one of the main objectives of the code I understand is to put all the parties on a level playing field and making sure that the parties have all access to the same information. And in a field where potential asymmetries have played perhaps a significant role, any effort made to close the gap should, we believe, be celebrated and to move forward. 
We also want to commend the drafter's decision to include within the general duties and responsibilities of adjudicators listed in Article 3, the duties to be available, act with diligence, civility, and, and efficiency. Um, this perhaps will be uh, some of the, of the parts of the code that are ready, as, as, as uh, for example, uh, John already mentioned. But it is, uh, I believe, an, an important uh, part of what delegates had been requested, at least uh, if, if you listen to the interventions that were made on, on your uh, working group three. Uh, articles three and, and eight, where this obligations is further developed, will signal to tribunals, among others, that by accepting an appointment, they agree to prioritize their adjudicator work over competing demand. And one thing that we think needs to be explored further is if this is, these provisions will be sufficient to ensure that arbitrators don't resign during the proceeding, unless there's justifiable cause, of course, which was a question that was raised by a number of uh, delegations past October. Draft Article 8.1 also refers to the adjudicator's obligations to per perform their duties diligently. We understand that the criteria of diligence differs from the notion of acting in a punctual or expeditious manner and wonder whether this term also may incorporate other questions or otherwise it needs to be clarified. For example, does it uh, incorporate the obligation to uh, make a comprehensive and thorough review of the full record of the case and of all the evidence uh, presented to the tribunal, which was also something uh, requested by many states last October. We also agree that there are, there are some, some other questions where the code is not quite ripe. Uh, many have already been mentioned. Article six, of course, is uh, something that needs to be still thought through. Um, many of us might consider that it doesn't go far enough. Other considers that it doesn't need to be there. Article 12, of course, on enforcement is another question that uh, needs a thorough uh, and uh, long discussion. There's one that perhaps uh, will uh, get less attention that I want to bring, um, that I want to mention to you today. And this is, uh, it, it's included in Article 5. Uh, the Article 5 encompasses a broad disclosure obligation requiring adjudicators to be proactive and to make all reasonable efforts to become aware of interest, relationships, or matters that could reasonably be considered to affect their independence and impartiality. And of course, this is, this is more than welcome. But we wonder whether Article 5.2, which requires the adjudicator to disclose a list of all publications and relevant public speeches could have a variety of unwanted effects without really addressing the very difficult question of issue conflict. Now, we don't believe that the disclosure is per se a bad initiative, and no doubt it could expedite the due diligence conducted by parties. But perhaps by including it in Article 5 with other elements that have in the past served as basis for successful challenges may not be sending the appropriate message and could inadvertently prevent necessary academic discussions from flourishing. Academic publications, studies, and empirical analysis of the issues commonly discussed in ISDS have been a very important engine for the development of international investment law and even for needed potential changes in ISDS cases. So we want to make sure that this don't dry up because of their potential to create a conflict. Therefore, uh, states may want to find more creative ways to, of course, get the information and get those disclosures while making sure that academic publications are not assigned disproportionate weight when considering the existence of conflict. And with this, I finish this first part of, of my remarks and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for, for all these very uh, rich uh, remarks. So I, I will give uh, to Chiara a chance to, to, to see whether she would like to add something. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I thought, uh, thank you for, to, to, to all the speakers. Uh, I'm really delighted to, uh, to hear the comments uh, and very, very, very interesting. You really raised some very important issues and I'm pleased to see that to, to a certain extent, there is some com commonalities so I, I, um, on, on, the, on the need of the, uh, of the code and how much uh, kind of there is an agreement on 
uh, on on May a lot of different uh, substance uh, that is included in the code. And I, I'm sorry if I push this analogy of, of the fruits a little more of, of the restaurant, but I feel we are kind of at a restaurant and we all agree that we want to eat and we want to possibly have a small appetizer. We're not yet sure about the pièce de résistance. We don't know what the main course is going to be. And I really look forward to seeing what the state delegates and the discussions on the, on the main issues and what, uh, what are the main issues on, on you know, issue conflict and multiple roles. Um, which are, I think it's very important to, to launch and, and, and discuss all these issues because there have been many discussions, many criticism to the system and I think having uh, discussions such as these ones and the, one, uh, the ones to come I think are going to be very, very important. I would also like to comment on Gabrielle's uh, implementation point and I think this is really crucial. I think it will be very important to see how the code will be implemented and I think there are many different options and I think that again, state delegates will have to uh, make a choice. But I think, you know, maybe looking at the Mauritius Convention is one possibility, uh, inclusion on, on arbitration rules. But I think, of course, it will depend very much how will this code be implemented. Is it going to be a, a, a treaty? Is it going to be part of, of uh, uh, another system? I, I really hope that it's going to be uh, a um, um, uh, kind of hard law, right, included in, 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 in a mandatory mechanism. But I think you raised a very important point about implementation also. I don't want to abuse uh, my, um, my, my, my uh, comments here, so thank you very much, Helen, and uh, I back to you. Yeah, we will have the opportunity to, to come back on, on these issues because uh, we can, I think, very slowly move on to our second round of comments on more focused uh, uh, items, knowing that uh, each speaker has already tackled uh, more or less explicitly some specific aspects. So uh, I propose now that we, we, uh, we start this more focused discussion. We also have received already some, uh, some questions and uh, among them, the reason why the draft code does not refer to the IBA uh, rules already uh, existing, we will have probably the, the opportunity to revert on that. And uh, I propose for that for this second round of comments, uh, we reverse the order. If I can put it like like that and we start <laughs> the, with the uh, Mayre and uh, and the more focused comments you would like her to make. Thank you very much Ellen. Um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, the the more uh, punctual point that I want to address today is uh, whether there's a real dichotomy between enhancing diversity in ISDS and, and banning double hatting. Um, when the question of, of regulating multiple roles is, is discussed almost always and, and unquestionably, uh, one of the, issue, the first issues that is raised as a concern, and it, and, and it was raised, for example, today by, by John, uh, is the potential effect that a strict ban on double hiding could have on the diversity of adjudicators. <laughs> Some indeed consider that a potential ban on multiple roles could negatively impact gender, regional, and generational or age diversity and would reinforce the existing dominance of male arbitrators from Western Europe and North America. This argument has been repeated many times, and if you allow me a bit abused, and I believe needs to be thought through and given proper consideration. It is true that when we reflect on diversity, everything counts. Small and big initiatives like that, like, like alike, every single actor of the ISDS community must do its share to ensure a more diverse ISDS system. Diversity is no doubt essential for better decision-making process and good decision-making is even more crucial when the decision relates to significant issues of public policy and public interest as those at stake in ISDS proceedings. But failing to reinforce the duly separation of roles could be seen as a missed opportunity and would allow many of the ISDS detractors to continue to point to some of the flaws of the system. This includes the fact that challenge mechanism has not, has not worked well very various times and that additional safeguards must be put in place to ensure that a system continues to be perceived as adequate for the resolution of disputes between states and investors. 
And I submit to you today that diversifying the pool of candidates qualified to serve as adjudicators in ISDS may not require allowing adjudicators to act concomitantly as counsel or experts in other ISDS cases for the following reasons. First, those who ask us to decide between advancing diversity or backing double heading have not considered other forms of diversity that are also important. The double heading ban versus diversity of dichotomy only makes sense if you consider that individual arbitrators should be drawn primarily from the ranks of counsel, which in turn suggests that we did not consider, consider diversity of backgrounds, profiles, work experiences, or legal training in order to have appropriate adjudicators. These are indeed other elements of the diversity question that should not be overlooked. Second, according to statistics that were presented by members of the Academic Forum for Working Group 3, up to 2017, only one of the top 10 arbitrators who were engaged in the practice of multiple roles could be considered a diversity candidate, given his place of origin. He has since passed away, and even he could not be affected by the ban. There are no women among the top 10 double hatters. It is therefore difficult to say, as many have hinted on many occasions, that the cost of prohibiting double hiding outweighs the potential benefits considering the impact such prohibition would have on diversity. We submit that the opposite might be true, as the statistics also show that it is a practice that took off around the early 2000s and has increased over time. Therefore, if we don't make the effort to hold it right now, that we have the opportunity, its prevalence in the system and its negative effects will continue to grow. Third, it is probable that at least part of those who currently wear two hats as counsel and arbitrators will, de will decide or will be forced to decide to give priority to their counsel work. This will in turn leave space for new entrants, which could very well be female or from other potential regions, or at the very minimum, simply new entrants. Steering things up by banning multiple simultaneous roles in ISDS proceedings could do a lot more to push the diversity agenda forward than if we just maintain the status quo or simply require disclosure of roles. Finally, the perception of illegitimacy that this practice has drawn to ISDS has had tremendous consequences for the system, which could be in and of itself a sufficient reason to eliminate it. So even if one were to agree that the alleged ethical ambiguity may be perceived as a problem, but it has not affected in a meaningful way the conduct of proceedings, which was something that perhaps John hinted to, the fact is that the practice, by its mere existence, has negatively affected the credibility of the current system and, most importantly, the acceptance of outcomes by disputing parties. Therefore, it would be a mistake to look the other way and maintain a hurtful practice for a supposed benefit on diversity when diversity, with or without double hatting, is a question that, as a community, we've been unable or unwilling to tackle since it requires more structural and long-term persistent efforts. Now, to conclude on this point, while we agree 100% that the ISDS community should make every and all efforts to increase diversity among adjudicators, banning multiple roles does not necessarily move against this goal. On the contrary, perhaps the ban on multiple hats is exactly the kind of change that is needed to respond to those who demand that ISDS take into consideration a wider set of stakeholders, including a more diverse ISDS system. And finally, and with this, I'll end my, my formal remarks. I just want to briefly touch upon the question of, of implementation uh, that both Chiara and, and Gabrielle have, have mentioned and that sometimes it has been uh, presented as, as perhaps difficult because of the decentralized and ad hoc nature of uh, ISDS. We believe that incorporating a final and agreed code of conduct in a multilateral investment reform agreement or multilateral treaty on ISDS reform, however you want to call it, like the one that Chile together with Mexico, Peru, Japan, and Israel proposed in a working paper submitted to UNCITRAL and was also proposed separately by Colombia could be an excellent implementation option. This mechanism would allow for the code to apply not only to future investment treaties and disputes, but also to existing treaties, thereby, thereby ensuring a, tr a truly universal application and preventing a possible fragmentation of ethical standards. 
So to conclude, we believe that the code is a great candidate for an early harvest of the ISDS reform options discussed today at UNCITROS Working Group 3. Or if we, do, we prefer to go back to the metaphors that we've been using, it is a low hanging fruit and it is in the state's hand to ensure that such a needed reform option does not become an unreachable goal. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I pass the floor, uh, I believe, to Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayri. We could see that you were truly convinced about uh, especially di diversity and it is important to, 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 to discuss this topic because it, it's the core of the, of the discussion, uh, I think, uh, indeed. And, um, and uh, I would like to invite uh, Gabrielle to comment. Yes, maybe I can simply uh, follow up on my and speak about double hatting as well. I had two topics, which one is disclosure and one is double hatting or multiple roles in Article 6. Um, I do find Article 6 a very timid rule uh, with lots of brackets. If the only obligation is disclosure, then we can strike Article 6 because it's covered by Article 5. Uh, the problem with multiple roles is, is arises because investment disputes give rise to recurrent identical or quasi-identical issues irrespective of the applicable treaty. And the problem is that suspicion arises that the performance in one role on a similar or identical issue does influence the performance in another role. And that gives an appearance of bias, uh, not necessarily a true bias, but we all know that bias is a, uh, these issues are about perception. And uh, as Mary says, it does uh, hurt the system, uh, which uh, we, if we want the system to be credible, we need to do something about double hatting. I'm fully uh, in agreement with that. So if the problem is, is correctly identified, then the rule cannot be limited to same parties. It cannot be limited to same facts, and it cannot be limited to same treaty. That's about the different brackets, right? It should be straightforward, a ban on double hatting, like we find, for instance, in CETA. Now, some may then say, well, CETA is more kind of a semi-permanent uh, body. It's not comparable. But then I would uh, refer you to the CPTPP, uh, to the Dutch model BIT, and there's other examples. So um, that seems to me, uh, a position that is somehow quite clear uh, to switch fields. Uh, 20 years ago, I introduced a, a double hatting ban in sports arbitration. And, and the issues are the same. You have recurrent and the sports governing bodies regulations, you have recurrent issues. And now it's very clear that in sports arbitration, nobody doubts this. You cannot be advocate and arbitrator on the roster of the Court of Arbitration for Sport. So, uh, but having said that, I am truly troubled by the entry barrier uh, objection. And it does play against the renewal of the pool and uh, there are uh, legitimate concerns about the pool being too small, too narrow, with too many repeat players. It plays against age diversity and it does play against gender and regional diversity at the same time because the existing arbitrators are not very diverse and if you bar the entry of others, uh, you reduce uh, diversity overall and that is not good for a long-term sustainable uh, ISDS system. So I was more trying to look, uh, rather than saying there are other ways of achieving diversity and just uh, not count on people who have a council career, uh, that doesn't leave much 
possibilities because government officials have incompatibilities. Judges mostly do too. Uh, then who else do we have who has knowledge about this? Academics. There are academics certainly who could fill the role. Are there enough? Uh, do they have the right background? Do they want to do this? And, and, and therefore somehow sacrifice also their academic uh, freedom? These are all, uh, all legitimate questions. So I was asking myself whether some solution that has been uh, articulated at some point in this debate of having some restrictions, both in terms of time and numbers of uh, arbitrations could not be uh, it's not conceptually rigorous, admittedly, but it could be a pragmatic compromise that would allow people to transition from one role to another and at the same time be bearable for the system. But it's obviously something that the states will have to consider. That was my point on uh, diversity and double hatting. There was another one that I lost now because I switched order, one should never do this. Uh, it was about disclosures. Um, there, is, there are extensive disclosures and I think it's, it's a very sound practice and it's good to have rules because presently the practices of different arbitrators do vary considerably. Um, there is, however, in um, paragraph three of five two, Paragraph 5.2c, sorry, there is uh, an obligation to uh, disclose all the case, international cases. So I would say logically it has, this goes to avoiding issue conflict. So it's sufficient to give uh, investment uh, ISDS cases, commercial arbitration cases would be of no relevance. And other possible cases that create uh, possible conflict of interest are already covered in the, in art in 52b so uh, it would be sufficient to have ISDS cases now but that is an ongoing duty it's easy at the beginning of an arbitration to hand to the parties your list of cases I would do this uh, systematically uh, as you are appointed as you go along in other cases, if it's an ongoing duty, you should each time say so. Now, I have asked myself in this connection, is this really useful um, when we have a Nixit website where constitutions of tribunals are published, where we have a PCA website? Um, the exit, uh, exit itself in a disqualification decision a few uh, years ago considered that what was on the exit website was known by the parties or should have been known by the parties. There was constructive knowledge and therefore it was too, in this case, it was too late to try to challenge an arbitrator who had not disclosed something that was on the exit website and the Swiss Supreme Court that uh, is uh, now uh, seized more and more with issues of investment arbitration uh, holds the same with respect to the Court of Arbitration for Sports website. What is on that website is supposed to be known. So that is a question. We're, we live in an era of digitalization. Never before in history has so much been known of, about an individual publicly than now. And somehow, I think we should take account of this uh, when we draft this rule. There's a similar issue that arises with respect to the list of publications. Uh, Myre addressed this already under a different uh, uh, viewpoint, which is the chilling effect on academic debate. And that is certainly a, a major concern uh, that should be avoided. But uh, I published a book yesterday, but which I'm very proud, so I'm saying it now, uh, about articulation between national courts and, and ISDS. Now, should I have written today to the parties in my uh, cases that I that the book was launched yesterday. And do I have to write to them tomorrow to say that I have spoken publicly today about at the Max Planck Richmond University uh, webinar? Is this not very, is this not disproportionate? 
especially when you know that as a rule, uh, scholarly opinions are not grounds for disqualification. So I would uh, think that this needs some more uh, more uh, reflection. Uh, otherwise, the, the extensive disclosure requirements certainly uh, welcome. And there's, there's more to be said about it, but uh, I, I leave it here because time's passing. Thank you very much. I will ask now for the opinion of John. John will first try to unmute. Okay. Um, I'm going to resist the temptation to get into the having diversity discussion. Uh, I share a lot of uh, Gabrielle's concerns that, you know, where are these other people going to come from? Uh, if council work as council, uh, has to be cut off when you get your first appointment. Um, I mean, I'm one of the unusual people who didn't come by way of a law firm, but there are certainly there are government officials, but many of them are going to be disqualified because the people who know anything about it will have worked on these cases for their governments. There are NGO people, there are academics, but I wonder how many of them have the skills that would make for good arbitrators, given that ultimately, these cases are basically about facts, most of them. And in my experience, my academic friends, God love them, uh, and I am one, so I know, you know, are not the best of fact finders. So I, I'll stop that discussion there and I'll, I'll turn to what I was told to do, which was to look at, at particular aspects of the code. And here I'm gonna be bad. I'm gonna look at just two rather small little things. Uh, and then opine on a, a, a cosmic issue that probably nobody can do anything about. My two small little drafting quibbles. Um, one concerns the question, who is an adjudicator? Uh, and I would make a plug to at least include in the commentary uh, a reference to another group of people who aren't here now. Um, and these are confidentiality advisors under the WIPO arbitration rules and the UNCTRL rules. Uh, these are people who can be brought in to rule on uh, disputed issues of privilege and confidentiality. Uh, they are subject to the same sort of constraints of disclosure, uh, diligence, confidentiality as arbitrators. Uh, and I've performed this role, I'm familiar with it, and I can attest to the fact that you, you are, while not an arbitrator in name, you are performing those functions. So I think there ought to be at least some reference to make clear that the definition for investment of uh, adjudicators uh, includes folks under Article 3A to the IBA rules and the comparable WIPO provision. Secondly, uh, going to the point that uh, Gabrielle just made about how do, you, how do you deal with publications. And here I wanna widen the conversation a little bit to deal with the problem of social media. Now, I'm, I'm a Neanderthal here. I don't even have a Twitter account, and I certainly don't have any of the generational successors that follow. But I think we are all aware that increasingly uh, discussion uh, takes place in non-traditional fora. And, it, and if we are to list uh, publications, I mean, I, certainly on my paper resume, there's a long list of all the paper publications I've ever had and some online stuff as well. But what do you do about an OGMED posting that might be quite significant in disclosing an arbitrator's views? Uh, a comment on a Facebook page? You know, I, I don't know the answer, but I think it's a question that needs to be thought about a bit as we move increasingly to a world where sort of traditional paper, paper journals and traditional conferences are, are less and less the vehicle for scholarly expression. Now, with those two little drafting things uh, to the side, uh, I'm gonna turn to uh, a, a bit of a rant. Uh, and, and here I'm gonna be uh, sort of the, 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 the King Canute, the fellow who sat on the beach and tried to hold back the tide without great success. Uh, and I intend no criticism whatsoever of the, of the drafters of the code because they had to work with the language as they found it. But I find that the language that is often used in discussions of ethics uh, is not very clear and used in not very clear ways. 
Now, uh, consider the extent to which the drafters had to rely on that old standby reasonable. Uh, the commentary Article 5 calls for disclosure of relationships that are reasonably considered as affecting independence and impartiality. Now that's fine with me because I come out of a legal tradition where reasonableness figures prominently, uh, reasonable people, the actions or judgments of reasonable people provide a legal standard. If I had to decide a, a challenge on this basis, I think I would know what I was supposed to do. Um, the problem, of course, is that my own experience has convinced me that there are an awful lot of people in the world coming out of different legal traditions who don't happen to share this particular perspective. Uh, and so I wonder how well this is going to work for people coming from those kinds of legal traditions. Then uh, consider the bedrock word impartiality. Now in, in her wonderful book with the wonderful cover, Catherine Rogers Ethics book, I'm trying to get it, to it doesn't show, I'm sorry. Anyway, the, art, the artwork's magnificent, um, but so is the contents. And, and Catherine makes the point that I'm quoting here, the empty rhetoric of impartiality continues to confuse the debate. This concept impartiality, although we lean very heavily on it, we, I'm not sure we have a clear sense of what we mean, but it then gets linked with this other tricky word, independence. The two get merged together. We lose what seem to me ought to be analytical distinctions between the two. And then we have this sort of strange interloper that comes walking in, uh, conflicts of interest. And are conflicts of interest different than impairments of independence and impartiality? And if they aren't, why do we talk about them? And if they are, you know, where do the Venn diagrams intersect? Again, I, I intend no criticism here. This is how these issues get talked about, but I find that they are often that leads to a lot of a lot of confusion. Um, I, I was struck in the in the uh, in the CETA that uh, Article uh, 8, 3, 830, I think it is, uh, leans on conflicts. Uh, sorry, yes, conflicts of interest as the as the, uh, the the mechanism to deal with these issues. They don't even use the the, the vocabulary of independence and impartiality. I'd, I'd be curious someday if somebody will tell me how they how we got to that point, but. This, I think that to the extent that as the drafting progresses, as the thinking progresses, to the extent that any greater degree of precision can be, can be added to these notions, uh, that's useful. Now, sometimes the limitations of, of language are just, language isn't adequate to deal with all of the variables of human nature. Um, and so you have to rely on the sort of good old standards of good faith and the people, again, out of my cultural tradition think of as common sense. Uh, and what it, here I'm thinking of what it means to be a trivial matter uh, that doesn't need to be disclosed. Now, it's hard to find words that are more, we, we, we know triviality when we see it, or do we? Uh, and, and because the term is, the problem is, it, 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 it's difficult to draw lines here. I think a conscientious uh, arbitrator uh, would tend to disclose, uh, although maybe not to the extent of the fact that that uh, uh, he and counsel were both at Harvard Law School th to get together 30 years ago, uh, as uh, we confronted in one notorious uh, challenge case. All right, uh, enough of venting on language uh, like King Canute. I probably can't do anything about changing it, uh, but certainly it, the lack of precision uh, here, uh, it bothers me a lot. I can only conclude by, by doing what I should have beginning, which is to uh, extend to uh, the sponsors and, and the Institute and the University of Richmond and, and Chiara and Helen and everybody involved, uh, thanks for uh, including me in this uh, very interesting exercise. Thank you very much. And, uh, and now I will ask uh, um, Andres comment, uh, who will not be necessarily uh, in agreement with what you've uh, just said. But at the same time, um, and, uh, one of the questions which is uh, 
uh, address to to Andre that maybe he can take on board within his comment is uh, is whether the rhetoric in favor of uh, such draft code and uh, and developing rules in this field does not favor the development of frivolous challenges. Um, thank you very much, Selena. Thank you, everybody, for these interesting comments and questions. I will uh, try to be not too long. Um, maybe I can just clarify because it has been said that the EU, at one moment, that the EU considered that the draft code of conduct does not fit with the permanent structure. It's not exactly what I intended to say. Some of the elements fit very well. Some of the elements may need to be adapted, but there's something that we will discuss in the further discussion that are coming in or exit so um, we, we just because we are literally on the records here it's not that um, we don't consider the code of conduct does not apply we will have to discuss this later on and if I may just very briefly as a short reaction to the latest uh, reference to to the CETA agreement uh, I would just like to flag that um, where well, CETA has provisions on ethics uh, which are already quite elaborated as compared to other investment agreements there is a particular code of conduct still that is in the process of being adopted by the CETA Joint Committee uh, in a number of, of, of weeks or months, which is much more detailed and much more elaborated on all these different concepts. So this is something to uh, just to bear in mind. There is more than what is in the text of CETA itself. Um, I would like to, um, yes, I, I have seen the question by, by, by Christian Campbell, um, the question whether there could one imagine that certain rhetoric encourages frivolous challenges and does it mean that challenges are always justified? Um, this is exactly what, what, I, what I meant. I think in the, uh, in, if you go to a court, to a public court, um, uh, there's the question like, like Gabriela referred to of the collective independence, but if the collective independence is insured, normally uh, the judges are not questions or the independence are not questions in a general way. Um, if we are in a system where as sometimes I have the feeling in ICS, the litigation starts already at the moment of the constitution of the tribunal. Um, I have the feeling that there's a much stronger incentive to start with challenges because you're already in a logic where you have to try to push back against the other parties, uh, nominee or appointee. And this may potentially, yes, lead to challenges that may not be justified just because the dynamics are so different. And this is the kind of point um, I wanted to make that um, we fear that if these dynamics remain, um, then the code of conduct may help to, to police it somehow, but it may not um, get away, make us to, to, to get, get this problem go away completely, and it may resurface at different stages later on. Um, on, if I may briefly, on double hatting, just one sentence it will not surprise you that I say that. The more you move to a permanent mechanism, uh, the easier it is to regulate these kind of issues. And um, this is also what Gabriele said in the CETA. It is already regulated more stringently, but if you would have a permanent multilateral court with full-time employment, permanent salaries, it is much easier to prohibit other activities. On diversity, um, we also believe that um, this can be addressed in the statutes of a court, for example, of a permanent mechanism. There are recent examples like the International Criminal Court, which address issues of diversity in the status for nomination. So it is not something that, um, that cannot be addressed. I would like, if I may, just raise a last point, um, because I've seen also there were some questions about the IBA guidelines and um, etc. Yeah, I think what we do not have to forget is the public law dimension of the investment dispute settlement system, because um, the public debate has never been about uh, commercial arbitration. The public debate has never been about whether under the ancestral arbitration rules or the IBA guidelines two private parties can appoint a particular arbitrator multiple times and whether this arbitrator can also maybe be a legal counsel. This is never, these questions have never really attracted the interest of the general public and the policy maker. It is really when we have disputes where public policy decisions are put into questions and where awards may be paid out of taxpayer monies, um, that also the, these issues of perceptions start to matter much more. And I'm saying this because I think it will be 
important in the upcoming discussions about the ethics and the code of conduct that we keep this aspect in mind because I believe that among learned scholars and arbitration lawyers, uh, we may be able to at the end set up a system where all conflicts are disclosed, where um, independent operating authorities may be able to, to hear and decide on these issues, um, where or where the disputing parties may agree to waive particular conflicts, or where uh, on substance maybe uh, everything could be more or less fine for the world of arbitration lawyers that are involved, but if in the eyes of the general public the system still looks like a system of revolving doors where friends interact with other friends, where, where arbitrators may have some incentives to get more cases, where some big law firms control the mechanism, then I fear we will not win the, the legitimacy debate of ISDS in the public. And so I, um, I think the more we continue working on these topics, be it in the code of conduct, but also in the questions of overall ISDS reform, we should keep in mind that we're here in the area of public policy and um, public law where, as we hear so often, justice must not only be done, it must also, it must also be seen to be done. And um, I will stop here because the time is running. Thank you. Yes, indeed, the time is running. Uh, now we have uh, uh, tried to follow of the questions which, which were asked. Uh, they were, uh, most of them were partially asked by some of you. And uh, we do not have uh, much time. I would like now to ask Chiara whether she would like to, to, to answer to some of the comments. And maybe she could, uh, while answering, uh, tackle briefly some of the questions, especially the relationship between the draft and the IBA rules because uh, some people can be surprised that the IBA rules are not evoked or uh, referenced and also the question whether the best fate for this text is to remain soft law but become a usual reference in practice or whether we should aim more for a treaty like Maiche seemed to envisage as a, a favorite option I don't know and so um, and then uh, if uh, each of you would like to add a word on this, uh, he or she is uh, more than welcome. It is just that uh, uh, we have time constraints. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm also cognizant of the time, so I'll really try to keep my remarks very, very brief. Uh, thank you. I think uh, all the panelists had excellent, excellent comments. On the issue of, um, of, of implementation uh, and uh, soft law and uh, and hard law and and the uh, and the IBA guidelines. I think there are some issues that are, that are that are interesting. Um, so I would much prefer to see this uh, included in a in a treaty uh, and in any ways becoming hard law. And I develop uh, this argument together with uh, with Professor Jeff Danoff in the Agile uh, Unbound Special Issue that John has mentioned, articles by John, Helen, and myself uh, and Jeff. So just a pivot there because of a constraint of time, maybe you want to refer to that. I think it would be very important to have um, this be in included into the hard law, hard law. And this, I think, also kind of explains on, on my side uh, this, uh, um, uh, the fact that the IBA guidelines uh, have not really played a role. I think what we've seen in the table that is attached also to the code that explains and see all the comparison um, uh, draft uh, uh, codes of conduct that exist and in the commentary, I think it's much more targeted to the unique issues of ISDS and having a state and a public entity in the debate. So looking much more at, at intrastate uh, examples rather than a possible soft law example. Uh, one last point, if I may, the issue of diversity, I think is very interesting and I'm grateful for all the comments. I wonder what role the, in Article 6, we have the possibility of introducing a temporal limit and introduces somehow the phased approach um, so that a council may not, to, may not be required to choose at the very beginning once the person is appointed, might, may have a couple of years. And I wonder what the panelists uh, think about, is that something that might be a possible solution? So thank you very much again, and I, uh, I look forward to many, many more discussions.
Yeah, of course, there will be many more discussion, but I would like to give a chance to our other panelists to, to also maybe uh, say a kind of a wrapping word of uh, what they think in this regard. And one um, attendee said, do you know an adjudicator who is uh, self-conscious enough to, to be able to step down and or renounce an appointment because uh, he or she thinks so he would have a, a bias or a, or so uh, and in fact uh, I don't know whether you have examples and, uh, but um, uh, for sure bias are not conscious but it's not only about bias it's also about education I think it's about becoming conscious that some practices are not tolerated anymore if they were ever tolerated and so how to increase the level of, uh, of uh, awareness and uh, is very uh, important and this draft uh, contributes to, to, to that. So I don't know whether each of you would like to, to, to say well two sentences uh, as a conclusion or not. If this is not the case, I think we have covered the most uh, the important and hottest issues related to this, uh, this draft. We will follow with the greatest interest the development uh, linked to its uh, discussion and, uh, and uh, we'll see. I'm very grateful and together with Kiaha, I thank you very much for your availability to participate in this, uh, in this discussion, very rich from uh, beginning to, uh, to end. And and so uh, thank you very much uh, and I hope we are able to convene uh, in the near future another uh, webinar of the, of the same kind. It was uh, so great at the end of the day to be able to discuss with people who are at the almost the other end of the earth like uh, my head. And so <laughs> I wish you a very good day or a very good evening and all the same to all our attendees and for those who are not able to attend it will be uh, online as it has been uh, broadcasted. So thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.